Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at the psychology of burnout. With me is Dr. Gerald Lauren Fishkin, a clinical psychologist from Long Beach, California. He is the author of The Science of Shame and its Treatment, as well as three books about burnout, Firefighter and Paramedic Burnout, Police Burnout, and American Dream, American Burnout. Welcome, Jerry. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you know, because you work closely with firefighters, paramedics, and, and police, those are professions where there's a very high rate of, of burnout because of all the stress associated with the profession. But I believe burnout can occur in almost any profession. Well, it can. And it's not just the profession that, that helps to create the stress. It's how individuals learn to deal with. Mm -hmm burnout and the stresses of their occupation. Yeah. Anybody can uh, be in a high stress situation and, and burn out, but there are many people who don't burn out. It really mm -hmm. depends upon the individual and, and who they are. And we'll get into, I'm sure we're going to sure. get into the, what well, creates I, that. Well, I gather that in some professions there's kind of a culture of, you know, not talking about the stress. And, and that uh, only promotes burnout, I should think. Absolutely. Uh, how I got into this, this whole uh, issue of uh, burnout was uh, through my work with police officers. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, was a police psychologist for my city for many years. And what I would see is on the weekends and uh, such, cops and their wives would come in and they'd be just exhausted from the drinking of the night before. W the wives may have been beat up, battered, and abused by their officer husband. And I started looking at what what is this thing called burnout? Mm -hmm. And what I found was that burnout is uh, mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion. That's what burnout really mm -hmm. is. And many uh, cops and firefighters suffer burnout, but many don't. Yeah. And what I was looking at was the difference between those that burned out and those that didn't. And mm -hmm. What was the difference in their personalities? What was their di the difference in their up? bringing mm -hmm. and what was all and what also was the difference in who they thought they were and mm -hmm. that made a tremendous had a tremendous effect on whether they survived their profession or not because in in severe cases of burnout a person uh, will leave the profession and if they're a firefighter or a policeman right. uh, they're going to receive disability payments probably for the rest of their lives right there's some presumptive stuff about you know disability mm -hmm. like for uh, firefighters it might be their back or their GI system for for cops it's other kinds of things but really it, it depends upon how they deal with their stress mm -hmm. and if a person if a if a firefighter or a cop is drinking to control their stress or acting out or doing uh, things that are really not healthy to help them reorganize or s develop yeah. a sense of balance mm -hmm. because stress is about being imbalanced then you know if they're not doing things to make themselves healthy then they're doing something to make themselves sick yeah and I should think uh, in some cases, uh, especially for police and firefighters, they don't want to talk about uh, the horrible things they may have witnessed on the job in order right. to spare other people from having to be burdened by that. Right. And that all that unprocessed trauma leads mm -hmm. to stress and it can lead to burnout, also leads to shame, but it'll. we're not talking about that today. We're really talking about burnout mm -hmm. and, and how burnout affects an individual. It really affects their their sense of self as well yeah. it affects their their soul if you will uh, and who they are and whether they can continue to do what they were trained to do mm -hmm. because what I find is that especially with police officers the first seven years of their existence as a cop from Academy on to to the, that seventh year <clears throat> it helps them determine their personality that police personality mm -hmm. and what I find is that police personality may not be uh, compatible with who they are as individuals mm -hmm. they may overcompensate they may do a lot of things 
to, to help them deal with the stress mm -hmm. of the job, and especially uh, dealing with the public, because many individuals don't realize that being a cop is public service. Mm -hmm. It's not just the apprehension of bad people and, and doing that type of work. It really is uh, public safety and public service. Mm -hmm. And m many folks don't realize that when they come through an academy, they're not just gonna be deal dealing it in a heavy-handed way with the public. They're gonna learn to deal with the public in a proactive and a healthy way. Mm -hmm. But that is a function of who they are and how they learn to be in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, if we step back for a moment and look at, let's say, the uh, an analysis of modern society, right. uh, I'm pretty sure it was a great psychologist who wrote the book uh, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. Right. And it seems as if there's something about the modern world which has stripped us of our uh, core in some way. People live superficial lives. I, that, I believe that to be a, uh, to be true. I don't think many people live in a very basic uh way anymore. I think it's it's how much you can incorporate, how much you can do, how much you can buy, how much you can acquire. And I think we've lost a sense of what is basic to human to human life. And that is we need to eat, we need to sleep, we need to have healthy relationships, and we have to be good to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And those are the important things in life, I believe. Well, you used the word process yes. earlier, and it seems to me that if one is in a stressful profession, and virtually all right. professions right. have a certain degree of stress right. associated with them, even uh, y y this is a delight, doing an interview like this, but there are stresses as well. We're, yeah. under, we're under bright lights, right. for, for example, but the, if people don't process what's going on inside, then it gets stuck. Well, well, I think what we're really talking about is trauma, mm -hmm. and because you have to process trauma. This interview, I don't have to process because I'm not even thinking right now. <laughs> I'm relating yeah. with you, and when yeah. I'm relating, I don't have to think. Mm -hmm. I only think to solve a problem mm -hmm. or to write a, a letter. But in, in a situation like this, I don't have to think. Mm -hmm. I don't have to process, but I deal with police officers who are dealing with shootings. Yeah. And the number of post-shooting debriefings I have to do is amazing because we have to, they ha the officer has to process what happened, yeah. and especially if they took a life. Mm -hmm. Because these issues don't, don't go lightly in a, in a person's mind and in their sense of who they are. Mm -hmm. They carry this around like a lead weight oftentimes. And that's why we do these post-shooting debriefings to see you know what happened and and how the individual felt mm -hmm. and and how he's feeling he yeah. or she is feeling yeah. uh, they have to be processed out unless we process it out and process means working through it with tears and sadness and anger and all of the elements that have to be dealt with emotionally mm -hmm. if you will to free us from the guilt or the burden of carrying that uh, that shooting or that trauma along well, I'm going to guess that most of the viewers of this video are not going to be police or paramedics or firefighters. Right, or right. going to have other kinds of professions, and, and burnout also occurs there as well. Burnout can occur if you are a, a, a bagger at the local pharmacy, or excuse me, at the local uh, supermarket. Mm -hmm. Burnout can occur in any, in any profession, yeah. in any job, in any place. It really depends upon uh, how well we we deal with trauma mm -hmm. and, and what it is that we're dealing with. In other words, when, when we have burnout, it means we're exhausted. Yeah. It means there's nothing left. We've drained the swamp. Mm -hmm. There's no emotion. There's nothing left to deal with. I am at the base, the bottom of my existence. And typically we see that uh, in the form of, clinically of depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the emotional, some of the uh, anxiety disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, some of these things we see as burnout, symptoms of burnout as well. Mm -hmm. Trying to be super organized, being overly compulsive, mm -hmm. oh, you know, in that, in order to keep from feeling anything. Mm -hmm. 
because it's really about feeling at the end of the day. Because people who are burned out seem drained of all feeling. Like I said, they drain the swamp. They have no feeling left. Yeah. They're exhausted. Mm -hmm. It's mental, emotional, and physical. Oftentimes the symptoms, they're not eating right, they're not sleeping right, their interpersonal relationships are terrible, mm -hmm. they're angry, quick to draw, quick to scream, quick to act out. Mm -hmm. And these are all symptomatic of burnout. And they may not even know what's the problem. Right. Oftentimes when I deal clinically, and I have patients that are very wealthy, they may be real estate brokers and all that, but they, they come from toxic environments, they mm -hmm. never learned you know, good healthy relationship with their parents, and they never felt safe, and they, they, they strive for things, to acquire things, to be different, mm -hmm. to show the world who they are, but in the process, the more they accumulate and the more they gather, the worse they feel. So what does that mean? Yeah. It means they're really not doing for themselves what they need to be Their doing. Their life seems to be deprived of soulfulness. Their life sucks, mm -hmm. to, to use <laughs> the vernacular. Their life just sucks, yeah. and they suck with it because they don't feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And no matter what they do, they can't feel good because they're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is trying to overcome it by acting out, going to the gym, doing this, doing that, but never really dealing with how they feel. Mm -hmm and how exhausted, and how tired. And when you can get a person to start to talk about how burnt out, how tired they are, and what it is they're trying to accomplish in life, that's typically the, mm -hmm. the thing. You know, I think for most of us, we just wanna have, to me, success in life is freedom from conflict. Mm -hmm. That's my definition oh, of success. Okay. Freedom from, con when you don't have conflict in life, you're not gonna burn out. You see, if you have a yeah. conflict in life, you're gonna burn out. Why? Because you're not controlling it. Mm -hmm. you see, all of these things are coming in and you're not, as you said earlier, uh, you're not processing. Processing. And we have mm -hmm. to process life out yeah. in order to understand what's going on. Well, for some people, I can imagine that what they really need is a different profession. It's time for a change. I don't think so. No, no I, I think mm -hmm. not. I think if a person is drawn to, like, let's say police work, okay. because they, they, want to, they want to be the rough rider, they want to show the world how strong they are. Yeah. Wrong idea. Mm -hmm. the wrong idea about why you're uh, being a cop. Yeah. You be a cop because you go into law enforcement because you want to serve your community mm -hmm. and you want to protect your community yeah. because that's what it is to protect and to serve. If you're going there to because you like the uniform and you like the power, mm -hmm. wrong. And so often, Jeff, I have had patients come in who are power mongers. All, they really got off on the power. Yeah. They got off on the control. Sometimes it was two cops who, who were working together as a team. Maybe they were homicide detectives. Mm -hmm. And they really got off on each other. And they got off on the work they were doing. Yeah. But they were the coldest, most dispassionate people I have ever met in my life. Well, it sounds like this hunger for power is serving as a substitute for something they really need. That's right, absolutely. Absolutely, and what happens over time is the negative stuff starts to build up, mm -hmm. the daily negative yeah. stuff, and they reach a threshold mm -hmm. that overwhelms them. Well, uh, let me go back though to my original point because I can, using myself as an example, sure. I started out in criminology. I have a master's degree in the field and I made a major transition, so I'm doing this. I'm interviewing <laughs> you now. And, and of course, my viewers, regular viewers will know many creative people, uh, visionaries, psychics, intuitives, mm -hmm. researchers, right. uh, and, and brilliant thought leaders. Now. If I hadn't made that career shift, I, I suspect that any other career, if I had stayed in criminology, uh, maybe became a professor or an executive or moved into law enforcement, <laughs> right. uh, I would have burned out simply because I wasn't following my true passion. Right, and I think too, doing the same thing day after day mm -hmm. with and getting a negative uh, result yeah. creates a, a sense of not feeling uh, worthwhile, not mm -hmm. feeling good enough, not yeah. feeling meaningful enough. Yeah. And I think that in law enforcement especially, mm -hmm. or the administration of justice, if you're looking for positive regard, if yeah. that's your goal, mm -hmm. You're looking for power. You're in the wrong place, as I said earlier. You're but if, in the wrong if, place. I mean, most people, I think, ultimately, according certainly to the uh, 
uh, school of uh, logotherapy and so on. It's important to live a meaningful life. Right, and you know, I don't know if I, we talked about that. I studied under Viktor Frankl. Ah. I was his TA when I was getting my doctorate. Oh, well, so you know so, exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I can tell you. Man and his search for meaning. Man and his search for meaning. Without meaning and purpose in our life, yeah. we're doomed. Yeah. And I think meaning and purpose in, li in life doesn't require money and it doesn't require fame and fortune yeah. really mm -hmm. or s lavish stuff it requires the ability to relate and to find meaning and purpose in everyday life mm -hmm. even in the simplest things yeah. you know Viktor Frankl talked about when he was incarcerated in Germany during World War II mm -hmm. and the, the not he was the, the first uh, psychiatrist mm -hmm. you know in the in the uh, Nazi prison system and he he'd see patients looking at, at bugs flying around, little flies, mm -hmm. and derive meaning and purpose from that, mm -hmm. rather than thinking about how crappy their life was, or yeah. how doomed their, their existence was over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think it's important to find that pleasure in no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and the example of Viktor Frankl is, is that uh, you can be in the worst situation imaginable and still make your life meaningful. That's correct. If you find value and purpose in it and have an understanding of mm -hmm. it and stop doing the poor me's. Yeah. Because the poor me's don't get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. And especially if we're dealing with burnout, you know, we have to find meaning and purpose. Yeah. But we don't find it in the day-to-day -day, uh, drag uh, unless we um, have a deeper sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have that. Yeah. I have heard, for example, of attorneys working on big government cases where maybe the case will run for 20 years. They're investigating a corporation and then uh, somebody comes in and says, okay, we've decided to drop the case. And uh, some attorney has invested 20 years of their life and it, right. it's going to go nowhere now. Right. And we have to watch out for suicide, mm -hmm. suicidality yeah. in situations like that because if a person's whole meaning, purpose, and value came from what they were doing, mm -hmm. for instance, on that case yeah. or in those processes, and all of a sudden they're taken away, that, that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And we find for so many people who have lost jobs or who have lost their families mm -hmm. or have lost have had major loss in life. Mm -hmm. We have to find the meaning and purpose and value in that, or we will become burnt out, exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, we will drain the swamp. We won't have any pleasure. We have to process mm -hmm. these things out in a, in a proactive and a healthy way. Now, you're a psychotherapist. Yes. This is your specialty. Yes. People come to you, and, and I think they can count on you being a compassionate listener creating a safe space for them to open up about their pain. But isn't it really the case that we we need that more in everyday relationships? I think so. You just touched on the magic word, listening mm -hmm. without judgment. Mm -hmm. Because when we can listen without judgment, because our world is so full of judgments, you yeah. know, but the worst judgments are the judgments we make about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we live in a very judgmental world. Yeah. But if we can get the judgments, take the judgments away and just live our life and be proactive with our people, mm -hmm. the people around us, I think we'll have a, a, a much better existence. I find that in my work. I never find the day, to, and I see eight to 10 patients a day, mm -hmm. four days a week. I don't find drudgery in my work. I find the most meaning. In fact, at the end of the day, sometimes I don't even want to leave. I just want to sit there and process what I've done mm -hmm. and what I've experienced because I never find that I'm, and I've been in practice 46 and a half years, I never find that I'm tired or exhausted. Well, that's wonderful because burnout certainly occurs in the helping professions. It, most often it does. And you know, Freudenberger wrote the first book on, on burnout. I wrote the second. Mm -hmm. But he talked about burnout in the helping professions, social work. Yeah. And that's what he was writing about, why social workers would burn out day after day doing the same job. They mm -hmm. weren't finding any meaning, value, and purpose. Mm -hmm. They thought they were helping, helping, helping. But you don't 
get positive reward every minute of every day, yeah. you know? It's not like pressing a bar and a food pellet mm -hmm. drops down and you're nourished <laughs> like a rat in a Skinner box. Yeah. Life doesn't work that way. And many people in the helping professions find that they're overworked and underpaid. That's correct. And many people go into the helping, helping professions because they like the title and they yeah. like the things that come along with it but they forget what the real meaning and value is. Mm -hmm. It's doing this. Mm -hmm. It's sharing yourself with someone. Yeah. It's letting somebody know who you are mm -hmm. and, and how you feel mm -hmm. and being there for them with an open ear and just listening. Because yeah. to me, that's the therapeutic part. You know, many times I don't have to say anything in treatment. I just listen mm -hmm. and I'll let them and I'll throw a word or two out and let them know I'm really here. Yeah. I'm on the ground with them. And I think for many people who never really had that experience growing up, and it may be the most profound experience they ever had, mm -hmm. just someone listening mm -hmm. to them. Now there are cultures where psychotherapy is very rare. I think, for example, uh, in China, there are not a lot of psychotherapists. No. I have Chinese friends that are philosophers, PhD philosophers, mm -hmm. and they talk about it that they don't go, they use the family. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the family, yeah. the Chinese, the Jap. A lot of Asians don't come in for treatment mm -hmm. because it's, it's not like they're, it's anathema to them. It's not like it's, it's just not part of their it's culture. not part of their culture, so yeah. they need to have a, an alternative. That's correct. And, and I think that the younger generations, though, understand that. I have a lot of younger Chinese uh, like engineers, mm -hmm. young doctors who are coming in for treatment now because it, they're breaking from the cultural mm -hmm. uh, mores and, and patterns and traditions and are, are seeking help because they're overwrought. Mm -hmm. And they're, of course, living uh, near you in Long Beach. Right. <laughs> that, <laughs> so that's that correct. Helps. They're not in Hong Kong. No, they're not in Hong Kong. Yeah. They're in good old Long Beach, <laughs> California, USA. Right. But, I, I guess my point is that uh, if people would listen to each other more right. and create a space to converse more with their friends right. about about things that might be painful and right. not necessarily part of everyday conversation, we could reduce the the need for uh, these emergency interventions. Right. I think more important than that, I think people have to listen to themselves first. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that people are really doing that in, yeah. a, in a positive way. Listening to themselves, saying, who am I? What do I need? Mm -hmm. What do I need? How many people know what they need? How many people even ask that question? What do I need? Yeah. No, it's not another bottle of booze. It's not another, you know, shot of heroin. What you need is someone to listen to you. What you need is to, to feel good about yourself in whatever ways we can help bring that about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially if burnout is concerned. Well, it's a serious problem because uh, in, in our culture, we see that uh, some people go to extremes. They become violent. That's and, correct. And, and we're experiencing more and more of that. People uh, get to so alienated and so disconnected from society and so full of rage that it, that it can come out in, in, for example, a mass shooting. And I think uh, it's because people aren't tuned into what's happening to themselves and to people around them. Right. And the, uh, I mean, we just had a mass shooting uh, last week and and it's it's horrific and it's a zero sum game because nobody benefited nobody survives it mm -hmm. and you know when you what do mass shootings really represent um, it represents an individual who's so angry and has such uh, toxic hostility not only for others but for themselves mm -hmm. that they try to expiate that hostility or that that sense of shame or guilt yeah. uh, by taking it out on other people but you don't you don't change society that way. No, you don't. It just uh, perpetuates the, the cycle of violence. That's correct. And what we want to do is reduce mm -hmm. that cycle of violence because nobody benefits from it, violence. And it would seem that the profession of psychology, you know, of all professions, ought to be equipped to to help move society as a whole in a in a direction where uh, people on a large scale are, to use your word, processing. <clears throat> 
Right, and I uh, and I see this daily, and I actually am writing a an article now on the Orlando shooter mm. uh, who took out what forty nine people and and wounded to fifty seven. I mean, uh, and, and it's zero sum game. Yeah. What did he accomplish? Um, again, this is an individual who has such self loathing mm -hmm. uh, that you know he couldn't really express it. It came from a culture yeah. where his whatever he was feeling psychosexually was not okay. Mm -hmm. And again, these are the dialogues that individuals have to have with themselves and then to express to others. But identification is the biggest issue that we have today. Identifying who is uh, at risk. Mm -hmm. Who do we have to look at? Yeah. You know, we, we live in a culture today that, uh, you know, we, we want to be politically correct. But as I like to say, I think there's a, a, a bit of moral decay. Mm -hmm. So I think while we are socially uh, doing things that are socially and politically correct, I think there's a moral a sense of moral bankruptcy that I'm so concerned about. Mm -hmm. Because we have to be able to identify and look at problems uh, where they exist people who are potential uh, problems in our culture. We have to identify To do, to do it without being paranoid about it. Without paranoia or without an accusatory finger. We just have to be able to identify mm -hmm. who is at risk mm -hmm. and deal with those individuals in a proactive way. Mm -hmm. Without a heavy hand. Without a heavy hand. We have mm -hmm. to understand what our society is generating, what are we creating, mm -hmm. and what can we do to help it along. Mm -hmm. And through that, we need uh, better ways of identifying who the potential uh, actors are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the profession of uh, psychology and psychotherapy, I'm sure, has a lot to offer, and I hope that uh, many of our viewers will uh, pay attention to your words. Right, thank you. I hope so too. And I, again, I wanted to just kind of cap yeah. that the, the whole the whole issue of burnout is so important to me mm -hmm. because as therapists we don't want to burn out yeah. because that's a that's a waste of many years of experience. Mm -hmm. So we we need to tune ourselves up. We need to be uh, healthy for ourselves in order to be healthy for our our clients, if you will, our patients. Mm -hmm. We have to. Watch Watch our burnout. We have to watch whether when we feel ourselves, you know, falling down, getting exhausted, mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally, and physically. Don't run to the bottle. Don't run to the food. Don't run for sex. Don't stop. Take heed. Take a look at yourself, and then give us a call because you're not going to. We can't solve burnout through external means. We have to deal with it internally. Mm -hmm. Doctor Gerald Lauren Fishkin, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us.